Tales of Zillia 2 is a direct sequel to the original Tales of Zillia, an uncommon occurrence in the series given that most titles go the Final Fantasy route where they're all standalone titles that don't connect with each other for the most part. Given that this game is a direct sequel, I must warn you that there might be some mild spoilers for the first game. I will try to refrain from them as much as I can as I try to avoid spoilers in general, but you have been warned. Tales of Zillia 2 takes place one year after the events of the first game and star an all-new protagonist, Luger. For the first time in this series that isn't a spin-off title, we have a mostly silent protagonist. I say mostly because unlike most silent protagonists, Luger does manage to have a few lines of dialogue here and there when you aren't prompting him to make a decision. People seem to be split on this, but personally, as someone who really enjoyed both Personas 3 and 4, I think I would be a hypocrite be okay with it in those games but not in this one. In fact, I would argue that Luger is easier to put up with than the protagonist of the other two games, simply because he actually does emote properly. In the other games I mentioned, at times it became very annoying that the characters literally said and did absolutely nothing when they should have had at least somewhat of a response. Luger actually says things from time to time, and he emotes by looking angry, worried, sad, or happy. Now, would I have preferred Luger to just have his own personality? Okay, yeah, I would, but in the game's defense, it did a fairly good job, and it only bothered me on a few occasions. Moving on to the topic of decisions, this is something I was mixed on in the game. The game has a mechanic where your decisions raise affinities for your party members. I think if this was all it was for, I would have been perfectly fine with it. But it gives the illusion that your decisions change the story, which is just not true. The only time it does is at the very end of the game where your decisions can change the ending. Now, I liked the affinity system quite a bit as it does give you an incentive to be supportive of your favorite characters, but I didn't like being lied to about how my decisions could change the story when it didn't. Now, something I really enjoyed in this game, however, was all the character side stories that you can do. All of the main cast from the first game return, and each of them has a side story that spans across the entire game. These were very fun to do as you get to learn more about your favorite characters from the previous game. You get to see how they're doing a year later and what they're struggling with. Whether it's Jude's scientific research or Alvin trying to have a legitimate business to make up for his past, each of these side stories are interesting. Granted, some are clearly better than others, but regardless, I found them all to be generally enjoyable as they did a good job of fleshing out the characters even further. However, concerning that, I did have an issue with how one character was treated in this sequel, and that is Gaius. To those who played the first game, Gaius was the antagonist, and a stone-cold badass one at that. However, in this sequel, he joins the main party, which that didn't bother me. But what did was that his character in this is more prone to comic relief, which is in stark contrast to how he was in the original game, where he was dead serious from start to finish. Now, don't get me wrong, Gaius is still a badass. This isn't Rambo turning into Bugs Bunny or anything to that extreme, but it's still weird. The reason is because this character was established to be a certain way in the original game, and to see his character go through this rewrite without any reasoning in the game itself as to why is jarring. I would have liked at the very least that the character say that he changed since the events of the first game, or even better if the game had naturally developed his character in a way that made sense for him to be like this. Maybe spending so much time with the party has melted his heart in a way and he feels more comfortable being a little more jovial with them. That would have been perfectly acceptable. But as it stands, that didn't happen, so it just comes off as strange. Admittedly, it's not a huge deal, and I would be lying if I said these comedy bits didn't make me laugh my ass off, which I did. But it doesn't take away from how sloppy the writing is here, as there really isn't anything in the game itself that explains why he's suddenly acting like this. Getting off that, something that happens early on in the story is that our protagonist is burdened with an extremely shady debt that he's forced to pay off, which leads me to, into the debt system. This system poses a pacing issue, specifically for the story, depending on what kind of gamer you are. If 
you're more of a completionist style player, it won't pose an issue at all. Because the game gives you so many things to do that even if you've paid off the debt that you need to in order to progress the story, you may just keep doing side content anyways just for fun. And the pacing probably won't bother you. On the other hand, if you're more of a story driven player and you don't care to do side content, then this is going to pose an issue as the debt system acts as a wall that won't let you progress until you pay it off. It also doesn't help that with a few exceptions, most of the side jobs truly are just getting items and killing monsters, which may be too mundane for some. Now, I don't really even think it's that difficult to pay off the debt. It's usually not that much money, and it becomes even easier when the game introduces the elite monsters, which usually gives you tons of cash. Not to mention, by the end of the game, you actually don't even need to pay off the full debt, as at that point, it really only nets you extra goodies and an extra ending. Now, going back to the main story itself, it has our main cast dimension hopping. These different dimensions pose alternate timelines that could have potentially happened. This is used excellently in the game because it brings closure for certain characters. Characters that died in the first game may still be alive in the other dimensions, and this allowed the characters that knew them to make amends or to learn things that they didn't before and to give them a different perspective. Because of this and a few other interesting elements thrown in, the story as a whole is really interesting, particularly in the second half of the game where it really kicks it into high gear and lots of really interesting and memorable moments happen. Despite my complaints, it's an overall really enjoyable story. The visuals in Tales of Zillia 2 are literally exactly the same as the first game, to the point where it has almost all of the same locations copied and pasted. There are a few new locations here and there, but not nearly as much as I would have liked. Now, I don't know if it's simply because I haven't played the original Zillia since it came out, but I don't remember the game having this much slowdown during combat because this game seemed to have a lot of it. Now, it never dips into being unplayable by any means, but it did get annoying from time to time when things got really hectic. Thankfully, based studio UFO table come back to bring their brand of visual awesomeness with some more animated cutscenes that look simply stunning. My only complaint on this front is that there should have been more because they look so good. Speaking of things that look good, the in-game cutscenes that contain fight choreography were actually really well done. I was surprised at just how cool these fight scenes looked using the in-game graphics and were easily some of the most memorable moments in the game. The voice cast of the original game all come back to reprise their roles. As such, I would pretty much say that if you liked or didn't like the dub of the original, I can't see this changing your mind. I felt the performances were pretty much in line with the first game, so take that for what you will. Now, while the soundtrack for this game has plenty of reused tracks from the original game, there are also plenty of new songs made specifically for this one, and they are awesome. I have to make special mention to the final boss theme called Song For You. It's a great track, especially its use amplifies an already great moment and makes it even more memorable. I highly recommend looking up that song on its own after this review. Definitely worth listening to. The combat of Zillia 2 is nearly identical to the first game, however there are some noticeable tweaks that shake up the gameplay. One addition I really liked was the use of sidestepping. While it doesn't make it quite as sophisticated or as tight as the defensive and evasive mechanics of Tales of Grace's F, the sidestepping does do a good job of adding more to said mechanics. Now, more importantly, for the first time ever, we have a character with more than one moveset. Luger can switch between dual blades, a sledgehammer, and dual pistols on the fly. This makes him pretty much the most versatile character in the main series. He has tons of great moves, and it's just an all-around blast to play as. Another addition is the Chromatis, which is basically a transformation mechanic that allows Luger to really dish out some pain. The Chromatis is just a ton of fun to play around with. Aside from these additions, however, the gameplay is pretty much the same as the first game, but I do feel that these additions added enough to the core gameplay to keep it fresh. 
Moving on to the character progression system, we have the Allium Orb, which allows your characters to learn new arts and skills. Mechanically, it works very similarly to the title system from Tales of Graces F. However, I would very strongly argue that it's not as good. It doesn't offer the same long-term planning, nor the same sense of flexibility and freedom. You can also very reasonably learn all of the arts and skills for all your characters in one playthrough, which I definitely did not care for. Despite my complaining, however, I do feel that this actually is one of the best character progression systems in the series. The Allium Orb is still a very good system and offers a great sense of empowerment for your characters for a long period of time in the game. And I would say that I actually preferred it over the Lilium Orb from the first game. If I were to describe Tales of Zillia 2 in one word, it would be experimental. There are so many new things in this game not done before in other games in the series. Multiple movesets for a single character, a silent protagonist, multiple dialogue choices, and a few other things. While I don't think all of them completely worked, I do gotta hand it to the team for trying and mostly succeeding with their experimentation. Whether I like this game more or less than the original game is hard to say, because I feel it's more so a giant expansion pack rather than a full-blown sequel, making it hard for me to differentiate between the two as separate games. With everything being said, I really enjoyed this game. It's definitely a fairly flawed title, but I feel its strengths greatly outweigh its faults, as it comes off being one of the most fun and unique titles in the series. This has been Shintai, folks. Take it easy.